Good evening from London, everyone. My name is Vikas Putta. Um, I'm the founder of T4, and we use this um, T4 TV live stream to have conversations with friends from all over the world who I've met throughout my career. And uh, and through this, you know, also provide you an opportunity to 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 get to know them them and their work. Um, you know, the purpose of doing this really is to be a, this is to be an interactive platform. And so what we want to do is if you're on watching this in our Facebook group, uh, you should go to streamyard.com forward slash Facebook and give us permission to actually um, see your name and your profile pic. Um, you know, when you when you comment, I think that's more fun and more engaging for you and for us. And so we know who's asking the question. Um, you can also join our LinkedIn group. Um, there's some three and a half thousand of us there. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, um, which you're welcome to join. Uh, there's some nearly 15 odd thousand people there. And of course, if you're not watching this in our face Facebook group, you can also go to our Facebook group, which is nearly, if I'm not mistaken, just under 50,000 people. Um, so these are terrific communities that we've grown over the last year since the pandemic. Uh, and uh, whilst I'm not a big fan of Twitter, we also have a Twitter account, uh, and you can you can follow T4EDUC and myself on that. Uh, there's a new platform which my guest today, I'm sure, will be big fans of because it's very Californian. Uh, is we also have something called a clubhouse on Clubhouse called Global Education, and you can also connect with me there and on LinkedIn. And so when when I talk about um, you know education. Um, and we have a we have a multitude of subjects that we've discussed in this last year, but I can't think anything more important or interesting as a topic or as a hook at least uh, than this question, which is how do we raise successful young people? Um, and this really is the cornerstone of what educators really obsess about, right? And so whether it's through academic pursuits, whether it's through making sure your schools are incredible environments. Uh, whether it's through parental and community engagement, you know, whether it's actually politicians, parents, young people, employers, everyone really does have a think about it and has this as their anchor, which is how do we raise successful young people? And so today I have two friends who are joining me on this live stream, and they are my friends Esther and Ari. Uh, Esther and Ari, welcome to this T4 TV live stream. Thanks for having us. Excited to be here. Yeah, very excited. And so by way of introduction, um, whilst Ari and I are relatively new friends, Esther and I have known each other for a few years. Uh, we came across um, each other first time with the Global Teacher Prize, which uh, I used to run in my last job. And um, Esther, you know, is a prolific teacher. Um, and she, I've actually visit, I've had the fortune of visiting her school in Palo Alto in California. And um, and she's recently retired, um, and you know she's pretty well known in the education world, especially in the U.S., uh, because she's a super mom in her own right. Uh, and so we hear about tiger moms, we hear about this notion about pushy parents, uh, and all that kind of thing. And don't forget, I'm of Indian descent. Uh, you know, my mother is so disappointed I didn't become a doctor or an engineer. Uh, but in Esther's case, she has produced three incredible ladies. Uh, who have these very, very high profile jobs. One is the CEO of YouTube. One is the founder of something called 23andMe. One is um, actually the hot topic at the moment. She's an epidemiologist, if, I'm, if that's how I pronounce it. That's right. And so, you know, one, you know, if, if there was one person I was going to ask this question, it would be you, Esther. <laughs> how do we raise successful young people? So thank you for asking this question. And just so you know, I happen to write a book with exactly this title. No how way. To, <laughs> how to raise successful people, simple lessons for radical results. And so many people asked me this question that I decided to write a book about it because that way they could easily access the, the acronym that I put together to make it easy for people. And the acronym is TRIC and it stands for trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. And what I did with my children, and it sounds like it should be easy, and it sounds like everybody should do it, is I trusted them. I taught them how to do something, and then I trusted them to do it. And what that did is it empowered them because they felt that they could then do whatever it was that they had 
learned how to do, whether it's ride a bike or whether it was start a little company. I mean, they started a little company when they were like eight and nine years old. They were selling lemons up and down the street and they actually made quite a hefty profit from this. And then they went on to do other things as well. But so I trusted them, respected their crazy ideas. You know how children come up with the craziest ideas ever. And then I gave them a lot of independence so that they were able to do things on their own that they had thought about. Then I collaborated with them instead of dictating. And you can imagine what it is like to collaborate with teenage girls. Um, I mentioned that especially because, you know, teenage girls, um, they're, they're quite different than teenage boys. Let's put it that way. And I don't want to say anything else at this point. Maybe you can read the book. And then the last thing is treat them with kindness because they always made a lot of mistakes. All kids make mistakes. And so, you know, don't get too mad. You know, don't, don't take it personally and, you know, just move on. Don't, don't carry a grudge. A lot of parents carry grudges. And then I tried this out on my classes. I did the same methodology in my program. I taught at Palo Alto High School for about 40 years. And um, I built this program starting in 1984 called the Journalism Program at Palo Alto High School, Media Literacy. And it became the largest media journalism, scholastic journalism program in the United States with over uh, 700 kids involved right now. Actually, I think there's almost 800. And so the pedagogy was the same in the program. I trusted my students and I gave them a lot of responsibility. And what happened is that they then learned to believe in themselves and trust their own ideas and learn how to work with each other because it was all collaborative. It was giving them a lot of independence, a lot of respect, and always treating them with kindness. So in the book, there's lots of stories about some of the things that they did that were not so nice or not so good, which I then had to, you know, forgive them. They're teenagers, you know, it's a time for them to try out all sorts of things. So, and it works. So that's what I did with my daughters. And that's what I did with my students. And um, right now we have a perfect classic example of a highly successful student who graduated from my program in 2006. And it just happens to be Ari Memar, who is the CEO of Tract. So that's an example of a great student. So the proof of the pudding, as they say. <laughs> so the proof of the pudding sitting here right in front of you. Uh, yeah. Ari, Ari, we didn't call you the pudding. Uh, <laughs> you may be pleased to so tell us, Ari, I want to ask you this question in terms of when Esther talks about track as the methodology that she, you know, the acronym that she's come up with and the method of raising successful young people. Um, you being on the other side as a student of hers at Palo Alto High School, uh, how did it feel for you? Well, I think, you know, first and foremost, it was strange, like to start out with, because you're so used to the traditional education experience being highly lecture based, uh, teachers as a source of authority and knowledge. And in the Esther experience, it was flipped, right? So there was a lot of choice. And I think if you think of most students and actually most people, we, we, we love freedom of choice. It's no fun if we're told what we're do, told what to do. We, we want to have control over our own decisions. And I think that's kind of the essence of Esther's classroom and her pedagogy. Students had choice. Students were treated as adults. The opinions of students, no matter what background, what age, were treated with tremendous respect. And ultimately, you know, when I look back at my experiences, I don't really remember specifics of what we learned, but I really had a sense of confidence in myself. And I really had a sense of community and feeling loved and respected. And how you feel, I think, in those moments is what lasts you know, decades. And those little experiences, albeit you know, for some maybe very memorable, for others not memorable, are so formative in your own personal trajectory because it really just takes one person to believe in you or one person 
to tell you it's worth you know pushing harder and experiencing that adversity uh, and pushing through it to then kind of emerge on the other side a new person and so for me it was a an amazing experience and it's ultimately stuck with me you know through my career and so Ari in terms of like um, you know you uh, when Esther retired um, at the prime age of 51 um, you know uh, you've gone and set up a company with her um, called Track. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about that? And like, you know, this question, I, I think what, we, what we're trying to get to the bottom of is, you know, the subject of today is students as change makers, right? Students with agency uh, who are in the driving seat of their education, you know? And so Ari, I asked you that question because you're probably nearer to the student experience than Esther or I, um, you know, why is that so important? Yeah, I mean, I think for, for me as a starting point, you know, I think it's very emblematic of the whole philosophy that the student is running the company at this point. And actually, you know, Esther and I were talking about starting this even before she retired. And it honestly felt like a natural genesis of her career and my career. Um, and so it was really, for me, an exciting moment when Esther shared that same confidence that she had shared in me, you know, 15 years ago on that day, we decided to start the company. And I think it's so important because we don't really know what the future jobs are gonna look like. We don't really know how the world will change. We know for sure that technology is changing things at a incredibly fast rate. We know for sure there are incredibly big problems and challenges ahead of us. Now, the skills to me are existential skills. These are skills that all students, all kids, all adults are gonna need to have in their careers. You need to be able to think creatively. You need to be able to problem solve. You need to have belief and self-confidence in yourself and you need to have a capacity to learn. And so for me, when we think about starting track or when we think about the genesis and evolution of Esther's teaching philosophy, it all starts with self-efficacy, purpose, passion, grit, and building these skills that are transferable to a changing world. And so I think that's ultimately what you know excites me, excites Esther, and it's always so encouraging to me to see how big this groundswell movement is amongst teachers, amongst parents who are embracing this idea of a change in the education system and how we how we teach our kids. I mean, so the 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 follow-on question really really that does flow is why why isn't every classroom in the world teaching this way, Esther? I mean, you you have been in the education system, you've traveled the world, you've advised, you've consulted, you've sat on boards, uh, you've written books, uh, you've got a forty-year history in the classroom. Uh, why isn't, I mean, I'm going to lay this on your doorstep and not UNESCO's. Uh, why isn't every classroom in the world teaching this way, Esther? Well, I think the number one reason that they aren't teaching this way is because of tradition. People find it really difficult to change tradition. And the tradition in education is very strong. And so people tend to teach the way they were taught and they tend to parent the way they were parented. And so changing the, this mindset is very difficult. Um, parents like to think, and teachers like to think they know best. And so they say, I know best, I've been through this before, you just have to follow what I say, memorize it, and you're gonna take a test on it. I wanna make sure you know it. And so that, philosophy is embedded in a lot of countries in their education system. And so people come out of the education system knowing how to follow instructions, but not knowing how to think, not knowing how to be creative. And Sir um, Ken Robinson, who passed away unfortunately last year, says schools kill creativity. And unfortunately, you know, I, I've tried to make it the opposite. I, in my classes, I wanted schools to enhance creativity. But um, 
it's very difficult when we're bound by tradition and when teachers are forced to teach a curriculum that they may not want to teach, but they're forced to by the school boards and by the superintendents, you know, teachers really do not have a lot of control. They are, they're basically agents that are delivering curriculum decided upon by someone else, by the school board, by the superintendent, by the country, whatever. And so I think to make a really important systemic change, we have to realize how creative kids are and to give them an opportunity to use this creativity and not to squash it. And that's where Tract came in. We're trying to help kids that develop their creative sense and become change makers, become thinkers, become CEO of their own learning. And um, so I suggested that changing the whole system is a little tough, to be honest. <laughs> so we're just talking about 20% of the time. 20% of the time you give kids the opportunity to use tract in the classroom and enhance their creativity. If it's not tracked, it has to be some, some way where kids can actually be in charge of the projects that they conceptualize. And well, I don't Esther, what is it in terms of like, I hear you. Um, and yeah. I think there's this, you know, I, I read this quote last year on a website of an American organization, which said something like, for far too long, teachers have been the subjects of change as opposed to the agents of change. And that's the argument that you've made just now. And yeah. when I when I use that line, actually American educators jumped up on me and just said, nah, that's just not right and blah, 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 blah. And I, and I respect that view, right? And so how is it that you were able to buck the trend as a teacher? Well, um, actually, if you ask the administrations of the school, um, starting from when I first started, uh, actually, it was two years after I first started because I didn't have tenure for two years, so I had to behave myself. Um, but after that, I did my own thing, and that created a lot of controversy. And um, I wasn't afraid to be fired, like a lot of teachers are afraid to be fired. I I, I was married. I, my husband earned a good salary. Um he didn't. He thought, well, if she gets fired, no problem. You know, she'll just be there to make better dinners. You know, that kind of thing. So, I wasn't afraid to take a risk. And also, what I said, the reason I am teaching is because I want to make the lives of my students better. And I was just so passionate about it. I kind of did not follow the rules in the way that a lot of teachers do. Um, and so, you know, in I think the end of 1999, you know, when my program had grown to enormous size, it was already one teacher with almost 100 kids. I remember that they said to me when I wanted to start the magazine that was called Verde, they said, high schools don't have magazines. I don't know what you're possibly thinking about. And then the following year, after I had started it anyway, in my class, and we won the top of the nation a gold crown from Columbia. The next year, the school board said, "Oh, what a great idea to have a magazine! You know, let's let's give her a teacher to help her start this program." And so, there's nothing like these external groups that give you awards. I must tell you, that's one of the most important things. These groups they do a great job, and I mean, without that award, I don't think we would have been able to move forward. Right. Um, so, go on, sorry. So I was just going to say, every two years after that, I started another publication, which is how we now have about 10 publications there. I remember leaving your, your school with a whole bag of this stuff, <laughs> uh, which was great, actually, and very professionally produced. Uh, Ari, I want to come back to you in terms of um, bringing you into this conversation. So... Tell us about Tract and how other teachers around the world can engage with it. Yeah, I think to build off of what Esther was saying, there is this constant trade-off between introducing 
new technology when teachers are over allocated with their time and are working incredibly long hours and are being fed all of these different things from the top down. And so what we've seen though, is there is this incredible community out there that has gathered around this sort of student directed, student choice philosophy that Esther and many other incredible educators have championed. And this is manifested in Genius Hour, 20% time, project-based learning, uh, and even kind of gate gifted and talented uh, curriculum or activities. And so from our perspective, we want to be a technology aid for teachers who have already bought into this philosophy, but we want to make it easier. And we want to make it easier because we can crowdsource all these incredible project ideas through incredible young leaders who can teach and relate to students because they're just a few years apart and they can speak in a very entertaining, uh, you know, TikTok, YouTube style that kids love. I mean, this is where they're spending their time. This is how they're consuming content. And then additionally, we can help support them to actually become leaders, creators, change makers, and teach other students around the world. And so I think that's really kind of an important insight that you can't ignore this groundswell around kids wanting to become creators, kids consuming video content that's highly engaging, and kids ultimately being more socially responsible and caring more about the world around them and wanting to leave it in a better place than they received it. And so I see Tract as uh, an accelerant for teachers who are already doing or are thinking about doing Genius Hour or more student-directed learning within their classroom. And we wanna make it turnkey. So your kids can just log in, you can watch them, you can guide them, you can support them. And most importantly, you get your time back. They have a great time uh, and they learn these important skills and build confidence in themselves and hopefully turn those passions and interests into careers. And 10 years from now, we'll sit here and be looking at the incredible things they've done to improve the trajectory of humanity. So that's kind of the, the, the way I see Tract uh, helping and assisting you know, teachers all around the world. Well, what you say, what what you just said, sounds very cool. And I think uh, when you think about students as CEOs, I think it's quite important for them to drive the agenda, as it were. Uh, before we conclude, I just want to see what the comments have been and share them with you. Uh, so we have Shama Al Sarai from Iraq, who is watching and commented, said hi. Uh, Beatrice from Colombia. Um, someone on Facebook who didn't give permission to stream yard said creativity is to raise happy, successful young people. We have Branka from Serbia who says, nice question. Uh, we have someone from no North Macedonia, um, Akil Dala from Tanzania and the UK, um, someone else from Kuwait. Um, we have Navina or Nikita Daswani from Panama. Uh, and it goes on and on. And so Branka has said, yes, independence and freedom, trust. Um, Akil Dala, who's a friend, says, my son graduated from Oxford, majoring in physics. He decided to run a theater. He's really happy. Is he successful? Question mark. But I am happy for him. Yeah. You know, um, then Sali Abdullah says hi. Uh, and, she, and, and they're from Libya. Um, we have... Abdul Majid from Bangladesh. Uh, we have uh, a friend from Georgia. We have Frida from Sweden. Uh, we, and she she is part of this great organization in, in Northern Europe called Academia and Tank Om. Uh, Alejandra from Argentina. She's a country ambassador for T4. Uh, Kirsten is a colleague of mine. Yes, yeah, she says spot on. Teachers are forced to teach and assess using outdated approaches. It's frustrating. She was once a teacher. Uh, she also goes on to say, teachers that are part of the online global educator community are finding ways to break away from tradition and they create space to give their students opportunities to be creative, collaborate globally, and enable them to develop as a global citizen. Uh, Magnus Olsen, who I don't know, on LinkedIn says, I'm a student at a Swedish university uh, that is very innovative in their master's program in project management, uh, totally in line with what you are advocating here. Students being co-creators together with the teachers. 
well worth a look to get inspired. If interested to hear about it, contact Magnus uh, on that email address. Um, and on it is um, one of my favorite locations, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Nas Odyssey. And we have uh, Fazia from Pakistan as well. And so, um, you know, you can see that there's been quite a lot of traction. And I'd be interested, Ari, when you track, you know, who's actually downloaded the app and who's gone to your website, uh, where all these places are represented this evening. Um, but please know that you're more than welcome to come on later on in the year to tell us about any updates uh, from 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 what, on what you're doing. And uh, I'm sure Esther has another book in the pipeline uh, or, or something interesting and innovative that she wants to talk about. So uh, at any time, Esther and Ari, please feel welcome to ping me and come and speak to our audience. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you so much for including Thanks so much. Yeah, we, it was great questions and a great audience. And I'm so excited to see they're from all over the world. That is amazing. Thank you. Bye-bye.